So artificial intelligence is without doubt the most audacious, indeed the most ambitious goal of the field of computer science. It's been with us for at least 70 years since the time of Alan Turing. It'll probably be uh, another few decades before we achieve all possible aspects of artificial intelligence. But right now is a very exciting time for the field. And the thing that's triggered this excitement, of course, has been some very interesting developments in the field of machine learning. So what I wanted to do in this talk is to offer some fairly general thoughts about machine learning and also to share with you a particular perspective, which we'll call model-based machine learning, which I hope you'll find helpful if you're trying to apply machine learning in a practical setting. So I think machine learning is probably a fairly tough field for newcomers uh, right now. There are um, literally thousands of different algorithms. Uh, the conferences are exploding. NIPS had 6,000 6, people last year. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of papers being published. It's quite bewildering. How do you find your way around this complex field? And in particular, if you're trying to solve a practical application, which of these thousands of different algorithms and techniques should you be using? Indeed, why do we need all these different machine learning algorithms? Can't we just have a single general purpose algorithm that we use for all applications? Um, well, it turns out that we can't because of a very important theorem, which has this wonderful name of the no free lunch theorem. I love it. Um, what it says is that if we average over all possible data distributions, then every classification algorithm has the same error rate as every other when classifying previously unobserved data points. And so what that means is there's no such thing as a universal machine learning algorithm. So the goal of machine learning is not to find the single machine learning algorithm. Instead, the goal is to find a particular algorithm that's well suited to the specific problem that you're trying to solve. So one way to think about this is in terms of what we'll call model-based machine learning. So the difference between one algorithm and another, the difference between an algorithm that's good for your application and an algorithm that's not good for your application, concerns the, effectively the assumptions or the constraints that are built into that algorithm. And so the idea of model-based machine learning is to be very explicit about this. In other words, we're going to uh, not search this huge space of algorithms or pick ones at random, or ones you're familiar with, or ones you happen to have software implementations of. But instead, we're actually going to derive the appropriate machine learning algorithm by, first of all, making explicit the modeling assumptions. And we'll see how that works in a moment. So in the traditional view, we say, how do I shoehorn my problem into some standard algorithm that I happen to be familiar with, or that I happen to have software for? That's the traditional view. But in the model-based view, we take a different perspective and we say, what is the appropriate algorithm for my particular application? In other words, what is the model, or to put it another way, what are the set of assumptions that are appropriate for my particular application? So instead of thinking of the machine learning algorithm as the first-class citizen, instead we're going to derive that uh, algorithm. We're going to derive it actually from two things as it happens. The model and the model is the set of assumptions that we're making in the context of our particular application, along with an inference method. Now, I don't have time in this talk to discuss inference, but the, 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 there are probably relatively few different inference techniques that we might apply. They're fairly generic. They might be simple things like stochastic gradient descent. Uh, they might be things like maximum likelihood, or we might have some sophisticated Bayesian message passing algorithm. But it's when we apply an inference algorithm to a particular model that we get a specific machine learning algorithm. So you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. What about deep neural networks? Aren't deep neural networks a sort of universal machine learning algorithm? They solve every problem there is, uh, I've read somewhere. Um, <laughs> let's just think about that for a minute. Let's just start with a very simple, if you like, neural network, logistic regression. So logistic regression actually has some very strong assumptions built in. It says the output, y, is a linear combination of the features, the things that I measure, um, passed through some uh, nonlinear function. So those are very, very tight, very narrow uh, assumptions. A neural network is a little more general. It says that 
the output is going to be a nonlinear function of a linear combination of some features. And those features themselves are going to be derived by taking nonlinearities of other linear combinations of features. So we end up with this hierarchical structure. And of course, the more layers we have, the more money you get paid, we learned from Harry yesterday. Um, so even that deep neural network has assumptions. The assumptions are that the outputs are obtained by these simple linear combinations of features, which themselves are constructed hierarchically. Now, it turns out that that set of assumptions is very valuable in quite a broad range of applications. But it can't be universal because of the no free lunch theorem. And indeed, even that structure is often not sufficient. We often have, even in the context of deep neural networks, further assumptions. So here's a, a fairly familiar one. If we're looking at image processing, we may use a convolutional network. So here, there are uh, much tighter uh, constraints now that a node looks a little patch in the previous layer. And as we scan through the nodes in that convolutional layer, the weights are actually shared. They're constrained to be equal. So we have large numbers of weights, but relatively few independent parameters, so very tight constraints. And then we do some subsampling. And of course, this network may have certain numbers of layers, certain choices of nodes in the hidden layers, and so on. So a lot of assumptions built in uh, to these uh, seemingly rather generic techniques. So something else to consider is the relationship between data and, and these assumptions or these constraints or, or what's sometimes called prior knowledge. So machine learning is not data plus black box. Machine learning is data plus assumptions. We need data and we need the assumptions. Otherwise, the no free lunch theorem tells us we can't learn anything. We can't make predictions. So let's think about data and prior knowledge. Let's suppose we're trying to detect the presence of a person um, in an image. Well, we know that the presence or absence of a person in an image doesn't depend upon where they are in the image. And so if we have a, a rather naive approach, we had better have a very large data set showing people at every possible location in order that we can recognize a person irrespective of where they are. Now, a much smarter technique is to build in that uh, assumption of what we call translation invariance. If we bake that into our model as a, an explicit assumption, now we only need examples where the, uh, the person, let's say, assented in the image, and now the system will automatically generalize to any other position. So greatly reducing the amount of data that we need. So we see this relationship between data and prior knowledge. Now, you might be thinking at this point, well, hang on a minute. Yes, that may all be very well in the days when data sets were very small and we need a lot of strong constraints, a lot of strong prior knowledge to augment this very sparse data. But we're now in the world of big data. We're in the world of exponentially growing data sets. The amount of data in the world is doubling every maybe 18 months or so. We're drowning in vast quantities of data. So maybe we can forget about all these strong constraints and we can go back to some very generic weak models. Well, one thing to appreciate is that there are two meanings of the term size when we talk about data. So I'll, I'll distinguish between the computational size of a data set and the statistical size of a data set. So let me give you two sort of uh, rather hypothetical corner cases. Um, let's suppose we want to understand the relationship between current and voltage when we apply a voltage to a piece of, of metal and we measure the current flowing through it. So we might gather some data points. I guess here we've got seven data points. So each data point is a pair of real numbers representing the voltage and the corresponding current. And our goal is, uh, let's say, to predict the current at some new value for the voltage. Well, in the absence of any assumptions, it turns out we can't do that. The no free lunch theorem says we have no way of predicting the current at that new voltage if we make no assumptions. So we have to make some assumptions. And in this case, we go and consult our local friendly physicist who tells us, wow, this is, this is actually just a one parameter problem. The, the relationship is uh, linear, passes through the origin, it's called Ohm's law. And so we only really have to discover one parameter, which is the slope of that line. So in this context, seven somewhat noisy measurements of current and voltage really do a great job of pinning down the value for the resistance and allowing us to make a fairly accurate prediction of the current at that new voltage. So this is an example of a data set. We've got seven pairs of numbers. So computationally, it's a tiny data set. But statistically, it's very large. If I give you another million pairs of measurements of current and voltage, you can make a slightly more precise prediction um, but already with just seven, you're already doing extremely well. So that's a data set which is computationally small but statistically large. So to think about a different corner case, let's imagine we have images and we're trying to recognize or classify 
the images according to the object they contain, uh, airplane, bicycle, and so on. Um, the images might have a million pixels, and we might have um, millions and millions of these images. The space of possible images is vast. If you just think about a, a 10 by 10 pixel image, and each pixel is either black or white, then the number of possible settings of those pixels exceeds the number of atoms in the universe. And that's a tiny image. So now we have these, these million pixel images. Uh, even on a very big data set, is extremely sparse in the space of possible images. And so even, so this is a data set which might computationally be very large. It occupies a large amount of space on the disk. But unless we build in a lot of assumptions, we're going to find it very difficult to make these classifications. We're going to make a lot of assumptions about um, correlation of nearby pixels, translation invariance, scale invariance, and so on. And as we bake in those extra assumptions, then we can start to do a good job of classifying the objects in those images. So this would be an example of a data set which is computationally large, it has lo occupies lots of megabytes, but statistically it's very sparse. It's a small data set. So can we do something rather generic? Can we um, not only have a perspective on machine learning, this model-based perspective, which says instead of, instead of drowning in this sea of thousands of different algorithms and not knowing what to do, now we have a compass, the idea that we're going to uh, be explicit about our modeling assumptions, we're going to derive the machine learning algorithm. That's a nice perspective on machine learning. Can we do more? Can we actually operationalize this? Could we even construct tools that al would allow us to derive the machine learning algorithms automatically? So there's a dream. Can we, can we achieve that dream? Well, to think about this, I want to introduce another concept. So, uh, so far, I've focused on learning from data. So I see this as a, a profound transformation in the field of computer science. We're shifting from a world in which software is handcrafted, in which uh, developers tell the computer what to do step by step, to a very different world in which we write very different software. We write software that allows the computer to be adaptive, to learn, and then we train it using data. So to me, this is one of the most profound, perhaps even the most profound transformation in computer science in the 70 years since Alan Turing. What I want to tell you now is that there are really two aspects to this. There's a flip side of this, a yin to go with the yang, as it were, and that is another, I think, equally profound transformation in, in computer science, which is a shift from determinism and logic to a world of, uh, where we quantify uncertainty. So instead of thinking of everything as um, zeros and ones, we're going to think of things as sort of grayscales between zero and one. Why is, that, uh, why is that relevant? Well, I'll show you in a minute the intimate link between uncertainty and machine learning. But when we're in this data-driven world, uncertainty is everywhere. Um, we ask questions like, what movie should the user watch next? Or what word did the user just write with their stylus? What did the user just say if we're doing speech recognition? Which web page is the user trying to find if we're doing web search? Which, which link will the user click on? Which gesture is the user making? What's the prognosis for this patient? Uh, and so on and so on. In this data-driven world, it's very rare that we have certainty. And so we need to embrace uncertainty as a first-class citizen and think about how to quantify uncertainty. And of course, there is a, a, a provably unique, consistent calculus of uncertainty, which is, I'll show you all know, is probability theory. So let me just make one comment on probability, which is um, the sort of the generality of probability. So we all learn about probability in school in a particular narrow context, the frequentist context. We think of probability as the limit of an infinite number of trials. The probability that an unbiased coin will land heads means if we take a long, the long run frequency of coin flips will converge to 0.5. But of course, there's a much more general perspective on probability, which is as a quantification of uncertainty. And maybe it's a shame that it's called probability, but if you, if you try to ascribe numerical values to uncertainty and you do so in a consistent, in a logically consistent way, it turns out those numbers obey exactly the same rules as the numbers which describe the flips of coins, and so we call it probability, but it's a much more general view of probability. Probability is a quantification of uncertainty. That's the Bayesian perspective. So an example would be a, a bent coin. Um, let's imagine, I'm just making this up, but imagine the physics of this bent coin is such that if you flip it, 60% of the time it will land concave side up, and 40% of the time it lands concave side down. But now imagine one side of this coin is heads and one is tails, and imagine we don't know which is which. 
If I ask you to make a bet on whether the coin will land heads or tails, if you're being rational, you will bet 0.5, because if you bet anything else, I can make money out of you. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you believe the frequency of heads will be 0.5 or 50%. It means you believe that the frequency of heads will either be 60% or it will be 40%, but you don't know which. And so rationally, you bet 50%. So if you like, the frequency of concave side up is like the frequencies view of uh, probability, but your uncertainty about whether it will land heads or tails has this Bayesian component because the one side is either, uh, the concave side is either heads or tails, it doesn't change, uh, you just don't know which it is. So it's, it's uh, an expression of ignorance. So you may be thinking, well, okay, so we're going from a world where everything is zero or one to a world where everything is described by numbers between zero and one. That doesn't sound like a big deal. That sounds like a, a tiny change. I want to show you a little example of something which hopefully will convince you this is actually quite a radical and different perspective. So uh, here we have a bus, um, and then we have a car, and the bus is longer than the car, okay? If you follow me so far, all right. Um, bicycle, and um, the car is longer than the bicycle. Okay, so the bus is longer than the car, the car is longer than the bicycle, so hopefully you all agree that the bus must be longer than the bicycle, okay? Uh, we call that property transitivity, all right? Seems sort of complete common sense, obviously true. Well, it turns out that if you go from the world of determinism to the world of uncertainty, you can have situations which are non-transitive. And this is so surprising um, that, again, this is another great way of making money out of your friends. So here's how you can do it. There are things called non-transitive dice. So they have an extraordinary property. Imagine I take the, the yellow die at the top and the blue die, and I roll them against each other. Well, two thirds of the time, blue will produce a higher number than yellow. Two thirds of the time, green will produce a higher number than blue. Two-thirds of the time, red produces a higher number than green. Right, no great surprises so far. But then amazingly, two-thirds of the time, yellow produces a higher number than red. And that's because you can think of each of these dice as a random number. It's uncertain. It has a probability distribution. Uh, and the secret is just simply the choice of numbers. So I think if you look at the blue and the yellow there, you can see the yellow in this case actually always throws a three, but two thirds of the time blue will come up with four, one third of the time it will come up with zero. So blue beats yellow two thirds of the time. But that's true all the way around this circle in a non-transitive way. Uh, and if you want to have a play with these, at the end we're gonna hand out um, sets of non-transitive dice. You can collect these at the end. And the thing is, you, you see, if you, you, can, you can bet against your friends and they can pick whichever one they like and do the best of 15 throws or something, you're almost certain to win. And then uh, when they get fed up and they want your, your die, that's fine. You let them have that one. You pick the next one in the series. You carry on winning. Okay. <laughs> By the time they figure what's going on, you'll have made lots of money. Um, and you can read a little bit more about how they work at that, uh, at that website. Okay, so that's the world of probability and uncertainty. So what's that got to do with machine learning? Why, are there, why is there this intimate relationship between uh, probability and, uh, and machine learning? Well, I'm gonna illustrate that with a little demonstration. And the demonstration um, is actually taken from something that's very much a real world example, but it's kind of pared down to its basics for the purpose of this demonstration. And it's the challenge of recommending films or movies. So what we have is, a, imagine a big matrix, um, there might be 10,000 columns. Each column represents a particular movie. And we have users. There might be millions of users. So each row is a user. And what we have is some data. We've gathered some data about uh, movies that users like or dislike. So we'll have some entries in this matrix where a particular user has said they like a particular movie. There'll be some other entries where a, a, a user has said they dislike a particular movie. But this is going to be a fairly sparse matrix. It's mostly empty. And in a sense, our goal is to make predictions for these empty cells, because we want to know whether a user is going to like or dislike a movie that they haven't yet seen. So if we can just uh, switch to the, to the demonstration. So what we've got here is just uh, a couple of hundred fairly well-known movies. And this system has already been trained on ratings from uh, around 10,000 people. 
but it doesn't know anything about my preferences. I wasn't part of the training set. So what it's going to do now is learn about my movie preferences. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is pick one of these movies, and I'll drag it across into the green region, and that means I'm telling the system that I've watched this movie, and I'm giving it a rating which says I like this movie. Okay, so what's happening is the, the other movies are being arranged on the screen in a particular way. Now, the vertical position is irrelevant. They're spread out vertically just so that you can see them. What matters is the horizontal position on the screen. So if a movie is... Uh, tight up against the right-hand edge of the white region. That means the system is very sure, almost certain, that I'm going to like that movie. If it's tight up against the left-hand end of the white region, that means it's almost certain that I will dislike the movie. And in the middle, it's 50-50, very unsure. What you see at the moment is that most of the movies are kind of in the middle. You see a lot of white space down the right, a lot of white space down the left. The probabilities are all around, you know, between sort of 0.2 and 0.8 or something like that. It's pretty unsure for most of those movies whether I'll like them or not. And that's not surprising because it's only seen one data point for me, that, that one movie that I've rated. So what I need to do is give it a little bit more um, data. So let's suppose I've watched this movie, and let's say I don't like this movie, so I'll drag that across to the left-hand region. And what you see now is machine learning happening before your very eyes. The movies are spreading out left and right. What effectively is happening, it's comparing my pattern of likes and dislikes with similar patterns of likes and dislikes uh, amongst that population of people who've provided ratings. And the, the implicit assumption here, and the assumption actually that's baked into the model, is that um, people who share my pattern of likes and dislikes for movies I've rated um, will share my pattern of likes and dislikes for ones that I haven't yet seen, and that can be used to make recommendations. And so that's where these probabilities are fundamentally are coming from. Of course, it's not encoded in a set of rules. It's encoded in a probabilistic model, and I'll, I'll show you the model in a little bit. So that's what it looks like after a couple of examples. Let me carry on um, uh, giving it some ratings. So let's say here's a movie that I like. Again, we see spreading out left and right. Here's a, here's a movie, let's say, that I don't like. And now we see a very different pattern. We see a lot of white space down the middle. Most of the movies are either down the right-hand side, where it's confident I'm going to like them, or it's down the left-hand side, and it's confident that I won't like them. There's one or two in the middle, but most of the white space is now in the middle. So that's, if you like, the modern view of machine learning. Instead of thinking of machine learning as tuning parameters of a function, like some sort of glorified high-dimensional curve fitting, we think of machine learning as the machine having uh, a model of the world, which is uncertain and expressed through probabilities. And as the machine sees data, it uses the rules of probability to update those distributions. And as it becomes less uncertain, it's learning from the data. So if you like to the, the modern perspective of machine learning. I talked a little bit about the size of data sets and the difference between the computational size and the statistical size. Another way to think about this is the difference between data and information. So data is how much space it takes up on the disk, how many ones and zeros there are on the disk. But information is something different. Information, the, the theory of information was set up by Claude Shannon in the 1930s, and he defined information as the degree of surprise. And so we can look at the different information content of different pieces of data. So let's take, um, let's take one of the movies down the right-hand side. This is a, a movie where it's uh, very confident that I'm going to like the movie. So let's suppose I watch the movie, and indeed I do like the movie. Watch what happens to the other movies when I let go of the mouse button. So watch carefully. Yeah, I don't know if you saw that. Let's pick another example. So again, this is a movie that it's confident I'm going to like. And yes, indeed, I do like it. So I'll, I'll let go of the mouse button, watch what happens to the other movies. Here we go. OK, I guess you saw that, just a tiny update. That's because there's very little surprise in that data. It's expecting me to like the movie, and I do like the movie. There's very little surprise. There's very little information in that data. But each of these ratings contains the same amount of data. It's a one or a zero. So the amount of data is the same, but the amount of information is very small. Let's see what happens if I take a movie where it's very confident that I'm going to like the movie, but let's suppose that I don't like the movie. So I'll put it over here. So again, watch very carefully as I let go of the mouse button. OK. So a very different, uh, a very different outcome. There's a, very, a much bigger change now, and that's because there's a lot more information in that same amount of data. 
In fact, the amount of information uh, in the data varies from zero at one end and goes logarithmically to infinity uh, as we go to the other end. Okay, if we go back to the slides then, please. Okay, so that's the, that's the relationship then between, um, uh, between data and information, the relationship between machine learning and the quantification of uncertainty through probabilities. So what I want to do now is to introduce a little bit of graphical notation. Uh, some of you will already be familiar with this, and you'll learn nothing in the next two slides, I'm afraid. For those of you who may not have come across the idea of a factor graph, this is a, a really quick two-slide tutorial that will show you what the pictorial uh, representation means and will just allow you to get something out of the, uh, out of the pictures that I'm going to show later. So let's introduce the idea of a factor graph. And let's just have a very simple example. Let's suppose we have a, a couple of jars, a green jar, and a blue jar, and I might pick one of these jars at random, but maybe not with equal probability. Maybe I, I pick the green jar with 70% probability and the blue jar with 30% probability, let's say. And we can describe that with a little piece of graphical notation. So the circle here represents a, a random variable, an uncertain variable. In this case, it's the variable jar. So jar is a variable which can take the state either green or blue. Um, and it's a, a random variable. Its uh, state is described by a, uh, governed by a probability distribution. In this case, a very simple distribution, 70%, 30%. And that probability distribution is described by that little black square. And that black square is called a factor. And so there's a little arrow from the factor to the, uh, to the variable showing that that factor governs the distribution of that variable. Now let's imagine these jars have cookies. Imagine there are two kinds of cookies. There are uh, round cookies and triangular cookies. Um, but perhaps there aren't equal numbers of these. Perhaps the, uh, the round, there are more round cookies, uh, in this case twice as many round cookies as triangular cookies. So if I picked a cookie out of the jar, there'd be some probability, uh, in this case I guess a probability two-thirds that I would pick a round cookie and a probability one-third that I would pick a triangular cookie. Uh, the blue jar contains cookies as well. Perhaps it has a different proportion of triangular and uh, round cookie. So in this case, uh, there's only a one-third probability of picking a round cookie if I choose one from the blue jar. So the probability of picking a cookie depends upon which jar it is. So again, we have a random variable. The variable is cookie, and cookie takes the value either triangle or circle. Uh, it's governed by a probability distribution, which is the little factor, the square, the little black square. But the, the value of that distribution itself depends upon whether we're talking about the green jar or the blue jar, so there's a line connecting the variable jar to that factor. Okay, so that's, that we call that a factor graph, and it's called a factor graph because the joint probability distribution of the variable cookie and jar is just obtained by multiplying those two things together. So it's expressing the joint distribution that's a product of these factors. Um, and we can think of this as a sort of a generative model. That is to say, we can think of this as a, um, as a process by which we could generate data. So we imagine, first of all, flipping a bias coin to decide whether we pick the green or the blue jar. Let's say we pick the green jar. Then we reach into the jar and we pull out a cookie and we observe whether it's a triangle or circle and we put it back again. And so this is a top to bottom generative process for picking a jar and then picking the value of cookie conditional upon that jar. Um, typically, though, we want to do things in reverse. So generally speaking, we, uh, in, in a practical application, um, we typically observe some of these leaf nodes. So in this case, we might, we might be told that the cookie is a round cookie. And we want to know, did it come from the green jar or the blue jar? Now, of course, we can't be certain. Um, but what we can do is to compute the probability. So we can work backwards, in this case, with just a little application of the, the sum and product rule of probability, or Bayes' theorem, if you like, which would allow us to revise the uh, probability uh, of it being the green or the blue jar and to convert that initial prior probability into, into what we call a posterior probability. So this is a sort of lightning two-slide introduction to the idea of a factor graph. And we can think of these... Uh, elements as like uh, Lego building blocks out of which we can construct models. And those models can capture in an explicit way the assumptions, the prior knowledge that we're baking in uh, to our machine learning application. And so this gives us a mechanism to be very explicit about our assumptions. Remember, machine learning is data plus assumptions. This allows us to make our assumptions very explicit. So let's consider a simple example then that illustrates the difference between the traditional view of machine learning and the model-based view. I've chosen one of the simplest 
you can call it machine learning algorithm if you like, or a statistical algorithm, it's uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, so very widely used. And we can think of PCA as an algorithm, a, a recipe if you like. It says take the data, so imagine there are capital N data points, each described by these vectors, uh, little x sub n. It says first of all, take all your data points and average them. So think of this as a cloud of points in some high dimensional, let's say some three dimensional Euclidean space, cloud of data points. First of all, find the mean of the data points. Then subtract off the mean from each of the data points and compute this sample covariance matrix. And then compute the eigenvalue, eigenvector spectrum of that covariance matrix. And then retain a subset of the eigenvectors, M, which is less than D. So D is the dimensionality of this space, let's say it's three dimensional. We'll retain M eigenvectors, let's say two, uh, corresponding to the M largest eigenvalues. So we can think of this as a way of, if you like, compressing the data from three dimensions down to a two-dimensional linear space oriented in some way in that three-dimensional space. So it's a recipe, it's an algorithm. Where the heck did that come from? Why do that? Who knows? Okay, let's take a model-based approach, which is much more enlightening. So let's think about a generative model of data. So first of all, we're going to sample a data point Z in some M-dimensional, some low-dimensional space from some Gaussian distribution. So think of a two-dimensional space, draw a data point from the Gaussian distribution. Then let's project that into our three-dimensional space. So it's now a point in 3D space. And imagine a Gaussian, adding some Gaussian noise, a Gaussian blob around that point, and sample from that, and that's our data point X. Okay, so that's a little generative process for getting a data point. Sample from a Gaussian in the low dimensional space, projects in the high dimensional space, and add some Gaussian noise. We'll now do that n times, and here's a little piece of notation, it's called a plate. It just says take everything inside that box and replicate it n times. It's just a shorthand instead of having to write it out lots of times, so that's called a plate. And what that's saying is that the data points, we're going to assume they're generated independently. To repeat this process n times, we get a cloud of n points. So that's our generative process. So that's our model. That's the, that's the set of assumptions that we're going to make about our data. Now what we're going to do is come along with the actual observed data. So we're going to take the model and we combine it with the data. So the node at the bottom, or in this case the n nodes, because it's replicated n times, are shaded, meaning those they're now observed. Rather like observing that the cookie is round, we're now observing the values of those n data points. That's our observed data. And now we need to uh, do the apply Bayes theorem and work in reverse to update um, the fine posterior distributions for those Z points in that low dimensional latent space. What I haven't shown explicitly, although I could have made the diagram a little bit more complex, are the parameters governing the mean uh, of the data and the orientation of that plane, that two dimensional plane and three dimensional space. And we can infer those as well as part of that inference algorithm. And it turns out, guess what? It's identical to principal components analysis. So if you do maximum likelihood inference on the model exactly as I've described, the maximum likelihood solution is exactly principal components analysis. The difference, though, is we've derived PCA by making some very explicit assumptions. And as well as sort of shedding light on the nature of PCA, the more important thing is that if those are not quite the right assumptions, if we make some different assumptions, we'll arrive at a slightly different algorithm, but one that's more appropriate to the problem we're trying to solve. Moreover, you didn't need to know that this was called PCA. Okay? You just write down your assumptions, derive the machine learning algorithm, and it does the right thing. So let's suppose that that assumption, some of those assumptions are not correct. Let's suppose the assumption of these data points being independent is not correct. Let's suppose the data points are not independent. They actually come from a time series. And adjacent points in the time series are correlated. So here's, here's a case where we have, uh, here's our first data point. So at time step one, we have some latent variable mu, Gaussian, and it's generating, and it's emitting this Gaussian, Gaussian noise uh, corrupted observation x. But at the next time step, the latent state is not drawn independently from a Gaussian, but it's drawn from a Gaussian that's conditional on the previous state. So think of that as taking the previous state and adding a little bit of Gaussian noise. So for a concrete example, imagine we're air traffic control and we're trying to track an aeroplane as it flies across the sky, and we've got a radar, and once a second, the radar sends out a pulse, it bounces off the aeroplane, it comes back, and we measure the position of the aeroplane. Now our radar isn't perfect, the measurement is noisy, 
But also, the aeroplane isn't stationary. The aeroplane's moving. Okay, so the aeroplane's moving across the sky, and we keep measuring its position. So we've got a problem. The problem is that every time you make a measurement, the measurement is noisy. And the other problem is the aeroplane's moving. Now, if the aeroplane was stationary, if we kept measuring it, we could take all those measurements and average them, and the, the random noise would sort of average out. And as we got more and more measurements, we'd become more and more sure about where the aeroplane was. But the aeroplane is moving, so what should we do? Well, we could just take the latest position, the latest measurement. That would, that would get rid of the movement effect. But remember, the, 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 the measurements are noisy. And that somehow doesn't seem right, because we're throwing away measurements that we've already made that feel as if they could be useful. Your intuition says maybe you should somehow average the data points, but give more weight to the recent measurements and less weight to the more distant measurements when the aeroplane was some way off. So you could code up some sort of ad hoc thing like that. But instead, let's write down the model. So here's the model, and then we'll do inference, and the right thing will happen. So this says that the aeroplane was at position mu at time step one, and we made a noisy measurement of its position, x. Then it moved a little bit to some new position at time step two, and we made another noisy measurement, and then it moved to position three, and so on. Okay. So that's our model. And now we're going to observe the measurements, the things shown in blue, and we want to update the distributions for the, the latent variables, which are the actual position of the unknown position of the aeroplane. We want to know where was the aeroplane at each time step, and in particular at the most recent time step. And if you run maximum likelihood on that model, instead of getting PCA, you get something else. Now, there's something else happens to be called the Kalman filter. And a few years ago, I was writing a book on machine learning, and I had a chapter on time series, and I knew I wanted to talk about Kalman filters. So I got hold of some books called Introduction to Kalman Filters, and, you know, The Kalman Filter, and, and so on. And I found these books pretty impenetrable. You know, page, you know, chapter after chapter after chapter, to finally you got to the Kalman filtering equations, big, complicated, messy equations. A couple, a couple more chapters later, you'll get to the Kalman smoothing equations, and it was very complex, and I, you know, I found it quite hard work to understand. Here's a really simple way to understand the Kalman filter make those assumptions, run maximum likelihood, and what you'll get are the, the Kalman equations. If you just ask for the latest position, that's the Kalman filtering equations, we're going forwards in time. But if you want to use the, the, the newest measurements to work out where the aeroplane was a few time steps um, earlier, you have to go in the other direction as well, and that's the Kalman smoothing equations. But the great thing is you didn't need to know the literature or read these books about Kalman filters. You just write down the assumptions, run inference, and the right thing happens. And by the way, if, you, uh, if instead of having Gaussian hidden states, you have discrete hidden states, it turns out maximum likelihood is now the hidden Markov model. Again, instead of having the filtering and smoothing equations, you have the forward and backward equations of the hidden Markov model. Uh, derived quite independently, discussed in a completely different literature using different notation. Again, hard work to figure out what's going on with, Kalman, uh, with the hidden Markov models, but really you don't need to know. You just write down your assumptions, run inference, and the right things happen. So what I've shown you so far is, if you like, a perspective on machine learning, a sort of compass to guide you through this complex world of thousands of different algorithms. Can we do more? Rather than just give you a way to construct, in principle, to construct the machine learning algorithm, could we actually have a tool that would allow it to happen automatically? And so that's the goal of this particular project, something that uh, Eric actually mentioned in the introduction. So let's think of it like this. We'll talk about the inference code. The code, the inference code is the machine learning algorithm. It's the stuff you get when you have the modeling assumptions, you combine it with the data and you run inference. That computational process, the actual computational grunt of doing the machine learning, that's the inference code. And that's usually pretty complicated. I said if you look at the Kalman filtering and smoothing equations, you know, they're big, long, complicated, messy chunks of linear algebra, right? And all that has to be coded up. So you first of all have to derive all those, all that mathematics. That's well, error prone and time consuming. Then you have to code it up, long, complicated bits of code. That's sort of error prone and time consuming. Uh, but that's your source code. Uh, then, of course, it gets compiled with a regular compiler down to machine code combined with the data. You run it on your big um, processor and outcome predictions, of course, with uncertainty because everything's probabilistic. Can we automate that process? Well, it turns out that we, we can. And we can start from something else, which is we call this a probabilistic program. So the probabilistic program is a, a very short piece of software which really just corresponds to that factor graph. It just describes the modeling assumptions. So given the modeling assumptions, together with a choice of inference algorithm, we can automatically generate the inference code. 
Actually, it turns out that probabilistic programs are a little more general than factor graphs. So we can think of probabilistic programs as a generalization of the idea of a program, but augmented with uh, probabilities as first-class citizens. And so this is the dream of a project called Infer.net. It's been running for maybe 12 years or more now in the Cambridge lab. Um, we haven't really got to the promised land. Infer doesn't do everything yet. It can't handle all models and uh, all inference algorithms, but it's already very flexible, very powerful. One of the interesting things about Infer.net, it's not the only probabilistic programming language or environment. There are actually dozens of them. Um, what's interesting about Infer.net is that uh, whereas some of these other probabilistic programming languages and environments are aimed at, at generality, and they tend to use techniques based on Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which are very general and very flexible, but computationally tend to be very slow and inefficient. Infer.net uses uh, so-called message passing techniques, things like expectation propagation and various message passing, which are approximate inference algorithms, but they're very efficient and they scale. So for instance, we used Infer.net um, a year or so ago to build a triage system for exchange. So this uh, takes your email. This is not to do with junk. This is to do with taking your email and, and, sh and sifting it into high priority stuff that you want to see now, and then low priority stuff that you can sort of deal with on a Friday afternoon. And furthermore, to have a system which, just like the movie recommender, as you interact with your email and you delete and read stuff and file stuff, it learns a personalized model. You know, it starts off with a general model that's sort of decent, but then it, it personalizes, it learns what for you is important high priority email and what is, is less important can be, can be treated as clutter. And so that's applied to uh, Microsoft's email system on Exchange, obviously a very large scale application of uh, Bayesian inference. And so if anybody suggests that these methods don't scale, uh, there's a, a, a fantastic counter example. And we've used this in other contexts as well. The movie recommender example I showed you was just a little toy demo, but the code running on there, um, again, is based on info.net, and we use these uh, techniques and that code <coughs> um, to build the recommendation engine, which runs on uh, Xbox Live, recommending um, things up like movies and, uh, and games. Okay, so that's um, info.net. I thought I'd just show you the factor graph for the movie recommender. <coughs> so you see a lot of variables here, encoding a lot of structure, a lot of knowledge. This is, this is where the assumptions about the relationship between, uh, in this case, um, user features, because in a, in a real application of in a real movie recommender application, you often know something about the user. You may know something about their geography or their age or their gender, which might influence their preferences. Likewise, with the items, the movies, you may know the whether it's a romantic comedy or an action adventure. You may know the director, some of the actors, the length of the movie, and so on. Those might all be relevant. So you combine that with the ratings from other people. That's the, the collaborative filtering aspect. And all of them get combined together in this um, glorious graphical model. So that's the model. The thing we observe are the ratings. So we observe, um, obviously, the huge numbers of potential ratings. A, f a very few of them are observed. And then we're running inference to update the probability distributions for all of these random variables in this graphical model. And then propagating down to update the probability distributions for ratings that we've not yet observed. And that those give us revised probabilities for movies that the user has not yet seen. As that was what was happening on the screen when the movies were moving left and right, those probabilities were being updated by this message passing inference process. Uh, again, all built using info.net. So I'm just going to finish then with uh, a, a, an example, another example of the application of this viewpoint, and it's uh, an application in the domain of healthcare. And I've chosen healthcare for a couple of reasons. The first one is I'm personally very passionate about this. Um, we had a very interesting panel discussion just now, and I think one of the points was made about the, uh, while there are you know, many challenges and potential pitfalls in the use of machine learning and AI, uh, also the world that exists today is far from perfect, and that's certainly true in the world of healthcare. There's a tremendous opportunity to apply machine learning and AI techniques to make dramatic improvements in, in healthcare, and uh, so this is an, ap an application area that I'm personally very excited about. But it's also an area where, although we have a lot of data and potentially we could have a great deal of data in the future, there's also a sense in which when we want to deliver, deliver personalized healthcare, 
we may be in a world in many healthcare applications in which the quantity, the computational quantity of data may be very large, but the statistical quantity may be very small. So we may have huge amounts of data, but I want to deliver personalized healthcare to you with your particular genotype and your particular environment and your particular history and, and so on. Uh, we may be in a, a, a relatively data sparse world in which it's very important to be explicit about the assumptions we're making to extract best value from that data. So the example I'm going to look at concerns childhood asthma. So in the UK, around 5% of the population suffer from asthma. Worldwide, asthma accounts for a quarter of a million deaths a year, so it's a pretty serious disease. And we know that allergies um, uh, represent a major risk factor for asthma. Uh, but the relationship between allergies and asthma is, uh, is, uh, remains poorly understood. And so we want to see whether we could apply some of these machine learning techniques to gain better understanding of the relationship between allergies and asthma. So this is work that's been done in collaboration with colleagues at uh, the University of Cambridge, in collaboration with uh, academic and clinicians, uh, academics and clinicians at the University of Manchester. Uh, so this is based on the uh, uh, on MASS, the Manchester Asthma and Allergy Study. It's a birth cohort study. Just over a thousand children were registered. Uh, prenatally back in 1995 and they've been followed through their lives with, with this very rich longitudinal data uh, the children come in at ages 1, 3, 5, 8, 11 and so on for a whole series of tests and we have uh, some, some very rich data this gives you an indication of the data around 2,000 variables um, many of these collected at various stages, those, uh, those, uh, those regular intervals uh, including genetic information so very rich longitudinal data set now this diagram is something that we constructed in the early stages of the project and this captures at a qualitative high level the prior knowledge. This is obtained from the clinicians, this is obtained from the experts in asthma and allergies who are able to tell us what are the important factors and variables that we should consider and what are the relationship between them. So this is not yet a probabilistic factor graph, this is simply a qualitative diagram showing us the key variables and which ones are influenced by which others. So we can think of this as the starting point for being explicit about the assumptions that we're gonna go into our model, which will then be used to construct the machine learning algorithm. And for the purpose of this talk, I'm just gonna focus on this corner of the diagram, which is the relationship between the acquisition of sensitization and the way we can measure that through uh, a couple of tests. One is a skin prick uh, allergy test, and the other is uh, measuring allergen-specific uh, immunoglobulin E in uh, measured from blood tests. So here is our uh, model in some detail. Um, you probably can't read the font, it doesn't matter, the details don't matter too much, I'll just sketch this for you. The outer plate represents the children, so everything that falls inside the outer dark box is replicated just over a thousand times, once per child. The inner box represents the allergens, we've got eight allergens here, things like mite, cat, dog, pollen, egg and so on. And so there's a variable for each child, for each allergen, and in this case, for each age. So those boxes represent ages one, three, five, and eight. And each of those variables is a binary variable saying whether or not that particular child is allergic to that particular allergen at that particular age. And now we're making a Markov assumption. We're assuming that whether the child is allergic at age five uh, is independent on whether they were allergic at age one, conditioned on knowing whether they're allergic at age three. So in other words, as they go from one to three to five to eight, they either retain their current state of sensitization or not sensitization, or they switch. Now we have some measurements. We can't actually observe their allergic sensitization. What we can observe, though, are the results of these skin prick tests and the results of these uh, blood tests. And those are noisy measurements. And so the relationship between the observation and the, and the hidden variable is described by some probability. That probability describes the, the noise in the measurement process. And we don't know what those probabilities are, so those themselves are described by random variables which have distributions, and we're gonna infer those as part of the algorithm. Uh, likewise, these uh, so-called transition probabilities, the probability that a child who is not allergic at age three to pollen will become allergic at age five to pollen. There's some probability of that transition. We don't know what it is. Uh, so again, the value of that transition probability is itself a random variable described by distribution. We're going to infer that distribution. And then finally, uh, the top variable is a variable uh, per child, and that's uh, a class. And the reason that variable is there is because we're testing a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is presented to us by the clinicians. They suspected 
that the relationship between allergies and asthma had to do not with whether the child happened to have a particular set of allergies or not, but the actual temporal trajectory by which they had acquired those allergens through, uh, through childhood. And so the idea was to see whether we could detect natural groupings of children according to different trajectories of allergic sensitization. Uh, again, uh, this is built using Info.net, so having described this as a graph, we represent that as a probabilistic program, a relatively compact program in Info.net, and then the Info.net compiler automatically generates the much more complex inference code, which we then execute together with the observed data um, in order to make our inferences. One thing we can test is how many such classes are there? How, what, are, what is the natural number of groups of children according to these trajectories of sensitization? And the answer is um, four, and you see them here. So the top trajectory, the top one. Uh, so what you're seeing here, uh, the different colors represent the, um, uh, the different ages. So age eight is yellow and age one is in blue. And, um, and for the different um, uh, allergens, cat, dog, pollen, and so on, and you see these four natural groups of children. So the top group is quite a big one, 600 children in class zero, and they really are not allergic to anything. They're the lucky ones. At the bottom one, class three, they're just allergic to mite. Um, the class you don't want to be in is class uh, two, which is the last but one. These are children which are allergic to multiple different allergens, but also they're allergic early in life. If you look at the class above, class one, 200 children in that class, um, they're also allergic to multiple allergens, but they acquire that uh, sensitization later in life. So we call that multiple late. But the multiple early class, the one with all the color there, children who have early sensitization to multiple different allergens. Okay, so that's what we discover just by looking at uh, the data, looking at um, allergic sensitization. What's that got to do with asthma? So the standard... Um, predictor for asthma is called atopy. Is the child, does the child have one or more um, sensitizations to, uh, to some allergen? And so if we run our model for a simple binary two, if we force it just to have two groups, then we end up with these two classes, class zero and class one, and we see that 20% of the children in class one have asthma. So asthma is a label that's provided by the primary care physician, the, the general practitioner. It was not used in training. And we see that being in class one, there's some significant predictor for having asthma. But if we look at the natural groupings of children, we see a very different picture. We see that if you're in that multiple early class, then the probability of having asthma is, is more than, or nearly doubled, it's now 40%. And so there's a strong association between that particular temporal trajectory of allergic sensitization and the propensity to have asthma. Um, so finally, if you'd like to learn more about the model-based view of machine learning, guess what? There's a book coming out. Um, this is an interactive online book. It's freely available. It's available now as in early access form. The book is not finished. It's uh, maybe two-thirds complete, but you can go to that URL and look at the information that's there. If you do go to that URL and look at the book, we just ask for one thing in return, which is that you provide us with feedback. It's a small price to pay for a lot of work that's gone into this book, so just send your feedback to that uh, email address. Um, Several publishers have asked us if we could, wouldn't mind chopping down some trees and producing a sort of a hardback copy of this book. Um, surprisingly, that these things still exist. We have agreed that there will be a physical copy of the book. Um, we negotiated very hard for the highest royalty rates that we could. And uh, I'm pleased to tell you that um, uh, all of the royalties from the physical copy of the book will go to the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and they'll be matched dollar for dollar by Microsoft. So please buy the physical book and then go read the interactive online version because that actually has a, a lot more features and details. Um, okay, thank you very much. Fabulous, Chris. Fabulous. I, I love the clarity.